Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I think we still have a few people joining, so I'm going to give a few minutes to get settled and then we'll get on the way. Hello. Um, okay, I think we are good to go now. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, I'm your host, Olivia, uh, APEC MVP Community Coordinator at Microsoft. Um, this is one of the series of Dev Speak. So Dev Speak is a quarterly virtual event series created for developers and tech enthusiasts um, in APEC to come together and discuss and learn from each other and motivate, inspire, and provide support. Anyone can join us. Um, so if you're interested in, interested in our next event, please subscribe on YouTube, uh, and you can also find us on GitHub. Um, this is the very beginning of DevSpeak, so we need your support. There are tons of people who are supporting the communities as the current crisis hit all over the world. Um, especially, I'd like to appreciate all the people who continue to devote their time and energy to support the community. While there are frontline health workers who have committed to save the lives, we also have the tech community leaders who have been trying to support the community in any way they can. So today, Amazing tech community leaders across APEC will come together and to discuss um, how they build a support system to support the community. So nine speakers from eight different countries are waiting for you with two hours of uh, insightful content. I should also mention three exciting things about the event. Um, but before that, I want to give you a short moment to read our code of conduct. And let's promise that we all are trying to make our event safe and inclusive. So let me begin. So first, um, there is a five minute of exercise break. Um, led by Women Who Code and Azure Community. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like you to join us. So we prepare the virtual swag. Um, it's basically, you can tweet a photo or video of your desktop workout. Um, the most creative, creative one win the virtual swag. It's $50 of Elo Moves voucher. And the second thing, there will be the open mic. Um, it's like um, where you can join and hang out with all the dead people online. Um, if you miss the in-person meetup to just meet the random people and connect each other, then this is the chance that you are looking for. Um, you can save the link now, but I recommend you to join the browser um, because if you wish to join the mobile app, you have to download the Teams. So I encourage you to join the browser. Uh, we are going to share the link later, so don't worry. 
And lastly, there must be moms and dads and guardians to join us. Thank you. So we prepare the kids pack. I'm hoping that this is good enough to distract the kids um, for two hours. Um, it's like a worksheet for scribbles and doodles. You can download now. And also, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics briefly. Um, today's webinar is streaming on YouTube, and you will be able to watch it on afterwards as well. We welcome you to revisit the contents yourself and share it with anyone. Um, don't forget to put the hashtag DevSpeak. Slides will be also available upon speaker's agreement on GitHub. The, ha the hashtag for the webinar is DevSpeak. Whenever you have questions, um, I can see a lot of questions on the YouTube chat. You can leave the YouTube chat window, then the speaker can get you after the session. OK, this is Ed. Um, and this is the last one, I'm sure. Microsoft Build is coming to your room. Um, you cannot miss it. So if you haven't registered, then you have to do that now. Then let's get started. Let me invite the very first speaker, Kongpon Chana Kit from Thailand. He is a Microsoft student partner and a software engineer at Clevers. He will be sharing technical journey of developing and optimizing Thailand COVID-19 case and news tracking website. Let's give a warm welcome to Kong Fon. Thank you so much, Olivia. And hello, everyone. My name is Saki. I am a Microsoft student partner in Thailand and also working as a software engineer at Clevers Thailand. So recently, I and my team had developed a website for tracking COVID-19 cases and also news update about the disease. And today, I am very excited to share to all of you about the technical aspects, the journey of developing and optimizing Thailand COVID-19 website. So before we are going into the technical, let me walk you through a little bit of our website. Once you enter our website, you will find a quick summary of Thailand cases, which are total cases in pink, treating patients in yellow, recovered case in green, and total death in red. You can scroll down to view more information of Thailand cases grouped by province, gender, and age with the current with the country map to show how each province is doing. You can also view the trend and timeline of COVID-19 cases in Thailand, so you could understand how we are performing comparing to the past week. You can also compare how Thailand is doing with other countries, such as Italy, Singapore, or Korea. And we also provide data about COVID-19 cases in Thailand, general info such as age, gender, and location that they were found. And another big feature, which is the stats and trend all around the world. The map is also interactive, so you can see the worldwide trend of death, recovered, and also the traveling restrictions in each country. Another very useful thing is hospitals with COVID-19 testing. So we show the price of each hospital and also the context of each one. But not only statistics and numbers, we also have a knowledge section where we provide useful articles about COVID-19 so that visitors can gain more knowledge about, from, from a reliable source. And here you can read the full article in our website right away. And this will be written by our collaborators and open for bloggers who are willing to help. Latest news updates are also shown in our website so the visitors can understand the current situation happening in Thailand. 
And because fake news are all over the internet, especially in Thailand, so we provide a FAQ page with accurate information about the disease so that you are getting only the correct information. We are not doing this all alone though, because this project is a collaboration between people who are interested in solving the crisis together. So we at Clevers are responsible for the product development. Workpoint News, which is a news agency in Thailand, will help promote our website and provide us with up-to-date news about COVID-19 situation. We also work with Faculty of Communication Arts at Chilalongkorn University, which helps us gathering all the data about COVID-19, such as the cases, hospitals, and also knowledge about the disease. And lastly, funding from Thai Media Fund, which provides support for building safe and constructive media in Thailand. And here is the part where we are going to start our development. So we list out the requirements and also the constraints we are having in this project. It was actually hard to determine how many users are going to be using our website because that also depends on how it's going to be promoted. And at that time, we didn't have the promotional plan yet. Everything else is also dependent on the situation. We don't know if it's going to be a short-term project or it's going to last for a year. And we know for sure that the budget would not be much, just enough to cover basic service costs. And the most important question is how much time we have before the first launch of the website. So I asked my team if it's going to be like one month, two months, things like that. But it's actually only one week. So OK, <laughs> one week it is. Challenge accepted. As for the first version, we only pick three main features. At the top, we will have Thailand stats. Um, so until we can get that <coughs> get that second back, I think we can have the reason. I think we have to be like a reason. So the very special guest from Philippines. Co founder of the phone and second to Google. Um, he'll be sharing on the story of helping build for national scale digital infrastructure with the Philippines government. Um, like I'm sure that Jack, when Jackie's back, we can get the Jackie back. So don't worry about it. And and please join me in welcoming Winston. Um, I heard the feedback that anyone cannot hear me. Hello, Jackie. Hello, I Can lost my connection. It's okay. I'm really glad that you are come back. Yeah. Can you hear me, anyone? I'm just watching the comments now. Better now. Okay, so can you come back to the presentation? Okay, I, I will continue where I left off. No, take uh, it easy. Let me share my screen again. Okay, so sorry for my loss of connection. Uh, let me continue. As for the first version, we only pick the three main features. At the top, we will have Thailand stat summary. In the middle, we will have world map and statistics of COVID-19 around the world. And at the bottom, we want to add a knowledge section where, which opens the full article after clicking. For the website, we chose React, which is a front-end library for building user interfaces, along with Next.js as a React framework and a typing system from TypeScript. And this basic combination was actually very popular in, in modern web development, and our team are already familiar with it. One of the most important features of React is that it is a component-based library, 
So we can separate each part into components and divide it to each developer and compose them together to form a more complex web interface. For deployment, we are going with Wordsell, which is a cloud platform for hosting websites and serverless functions. It comes with a lot of features that match our needs. For example, it has an auto-scaling features, so we don't need to worry about balancing the incoming loads. This is our first simple system. We've got front-end and back-end using Next.js, React, and TypeScript deployed on Visual. And initially, we pull the data from external sources that are available on public, but just for the first version. And right now, we have a system for viewing statistics already. But what about the knowledge section? We need a place for bloggers to create content and serve it on our website, and that we might need to have a content management system. For the content management system, we chose WordPress because that is what most bloggers are familiar with. But we want to serve the articles inside our React website. So we are going to run it headlessly. The term headless CMS is gaining its popularity at the time. In short, it means that we are using the CMS, such as WordPress, just only for the content editing purpose. But we are not serving the website through WordPress. Instead, we build our own content with any tools we want and pull the articles from WordPress through its APIs. So this way, we could have WordPress as a content management system, but able to build our own front end while blockers are still writing on WordPress like they usually do. In the second version, we would like to add some original data to our website. So we want to modify some data because we have more up-to-date data than those external sources we are pulling from. And we would also like to add Thailand patients' information, country traveling status, hospitals, and also all the FAQs. And all these information will be added by our collaborators. So this looks like we are going to need some admin back office system for our team to fill in those information. But building an admin back office site actually comes with a lot of things to do. For example, we might need to think about authentication, which, which database are we going to choose, and even design the new admin user interface. We don't, we don't have enough time for that, for sure. So we are going with Airtable. So Airtable is kind of like an organized spreadsheet. So you can have relations, types, and computed fields. And it gives you the power of a database because it provides APIs to fetch those cells and rows easily. So we could have our admin to fill in the, in the data into the spreadsheets, while developers can pull all the data through Airtable's APIs. So now, we can have our admin back office ready in just a minute. And everything is working fine now. Quite an impressive system within only two weeks. And after that, a new opportunity comes in. So Line, which is a messaging application, number one in Thailand, wants to connect with us and feature our website into the application. So we kind of make a new page that looks like an app, and each tab will be showing an iframe of our website. Our website will be featured in many places, in the app homepage, in the official account, and even in the wallet. And again, this time we only have two days to finish this before launching. The development part is just fine. We can handle that in time. However, from statistics, Line has about like 44 million active users, and that is actually 95% of smartphone users in Thailand. Our site will be shown all over the app. And the problem is, with our architecture right now, when a user requests to our website, we will be fetching the data from various sources, from WordPress, from Airtable, and from other services. Those fetchings are actually slow because some sources are not meant to handle high incoming loads, or some have red limit restrictions. For sure, slowness will affect a lot of things. The visitors will be not happy with our website. But the most, in, the most critical part is that it would result in a very high cost of execution time per request. 
This is what we need to solve the problem. Instead of fetching to the original sources every time, we set up a cloud scheduler to run every one hour, which loads all the data from each source and dump it into our data store on Google Cloud Storage. Although this process is still taking the same amount of time as the previous one, but now the website will be fetching the data straight from our store, which will be much faster. And after the app is launched for a while, we have more and more new data sources coming in. We try to integrate and merge them together. And now we are experiencing problems with data integrity. The data coming from different sources are kind of inconsistent. For example, we have the same country with different names, or we have so many forms of empty state. So we need to convert each data into the same form. For example, we use the ISO country code to name the countries and remove the data that is considered empty. So previously, we only dumped the data as is into our store. So we need to compute the data every time a user requests to our website, and that task is kind of slow. To solve that problem, we want to pre-compute the data. So we extract the data from our sources. We do the transformation, such as cleansing, the duplication, and verification on our backend, and load the transform data into our simple data warehouse, which are just JSON files in Google Cloud Storage. So instead of dumping the data as is, we compute all the data beforehand and save those ready to serve data into our data warehouse. So this way, we don't need to compute the data on every request. And even faster, because the data is already to serve, we just directly fetch the data from the data warehouse without having an extra hop to our backend. And here is what the current system looks like. We have the website written with React, Next.js, and TypeScript deployed on Verso. We have a headless WordPress where bloggers can write on, external sources in various forms, and internal source on Airtable, where admins will maintain those data. We then set up a scheduler, which triggers our, black, our, our backend to extract transforms, and load the data into our data warehouse located in Google Cloud Storage. And now visitors in our website will be seeing our front end, which directly fetch the data from our data warehouse. And that was pretty much our system as of now. It is quite stable. It is running fine. The total development time of those four versions was about only three weeks. And now it has been running for about a month already. And for the next step, as the data is growing bigger and bigger, visitors will be experiencing slowness by time because they will be receiving a very large size of data at once. So we might need to optimize our website again soon. In conclusion, I think we are really, very lucky that nowadays we have many tools and cloud solutions that allow us to build products in a very fast pace. And most importantly, I am very glad that I could use my skills to positively impact the society. And for today, I hope you enjoy my session of developing and optimizing Thailand COVID-19 website. Thank you very much, and let's get back to Olivia. Thank you, Kung Fon, for your um, presentation. I think the visual images you put uh, really help us understand. Um, and I'm really glad that you came back quickly with us. And also thank you the audience for generous comments that really help us to feel relieved. Um, I don't see the, any comment right now, but if you have any comments, I can uh, accept now. So please type in the YouTube. Um, I have one question. Can you answer that? Oh, the question will be up here. You can see on the screen, Kung Pan. Uh, if you yeah, can, no. I can read for you. Okay. Um, so, oh, okay. How does it look like at line from Lehmann? Like at line, right? Yep. Uh, 
Hello, Jackie. Can you answer that? How does it look like at line? So, me. So, like, so like you mean the application that we are making, right? So, in terms of the the an application, we call it line COVID nineteen info hub. So, it's actually uh, I I can I can really show you right now because it's in in my in my mobile phone. So, I will just maybe describe the features that is different from our website. So in line, we also developed a mini app. It's a mini application where you can like scan the QR code and do the questionnaire and scan the QR code to check your check yourself. And 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 there you can find the information about the COVID nineteen. And that is where you tap on each tab, and you will see the web of what we are doing right now that I already show you. All right, thank you for answering. Uh, I think time's up. Um, thank you, Jackie. Yeah, thank you, Olivia. I think it's time to invite the next speaker. Um, he almost prepared, <laughs> but now it's time for him to show up. Um, next speaker is very special guest from Philippines, um, a founder of Debcom and tech venture builder. He will be sharing the story of helping build four national scale digital infrastructure for the Philippine government. Please join me in welcoming Winston. Hello, Winston. Great. How are you? Hello, Olivia. How are you? You're good to go. So you promised if I get disconnected, you're going to sing, right? <laughs> I hope you cannot disconnect. <laughs> I almost got caught my poor play. <laughs> yes. Great. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, speaking with everyone today. Well, I guess that's my cue. So thank you all. Uh, really excited to talk to you about uh, DCTX and DevCon. Um, we are a group of developers here in the Philippines. Uh, it was started 10 years ago in an organization called DevCon. And, uh, you know, as uh, we started uh, our response to the pandemic here in the Philippines, we were one of the first three countries to lock down. Uh, uh, we were requested by our government to provide help uh, in form of digital infrastructure for, for the country. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the technology, but also wanted to make sure that I can share with you uh, a lot more about the community. Because I think one area that's really exciting about us geeks is that we have a common thread and I wanted to share what we have learned uh, together as a community uh, helping to, to solve COVID for, uh, for our country. So again, DevCon 10 years old, uh, we uh, got together to teach its other new technologies. Uh, we've been growing quite steadily. There's about 50,000 members in the Philippines today. And uh, when the government uh, decided that we're gonna go on lockdown, uh, a lot of technologies needed to be built very quickly. And they, they came to us and asked for help. And uh, really what's really exciting from that perspective is that as soon as the government came calling, uh, we sent a message out to our community and uh, out of that, you know, one or two days worth of, of call for volunteers, uh, we were able to gather about 1,093 volunteers uh, to work on four projects and divided ourselves in 46 teams. So it felt to me like we, we built the Apache Software Foundation in a week. Um, and that's really, uh, the catalyst of all of these activities that we've now gone to the Philippines. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm superbly and extremely grateful to Microsoft. They were the first partner that we had that came to call and said, as you, as you put this together, uh, we're here uh, and we wanted to give you support. So immediately we were provisioned the Microsoft Azure infrastructure that's quite large. And we set up and started uh, building four projects here in the Philippines. Uh, first was called Rapid Pass. Rapid Pass is a technology that allowed people under quarantine uh, who are excluded from quarantine, and these are our medical practitioner and frontline service people that needed to go, get out of the house to get a digital pass in form of a QR so that they're able to pass and get expedited access through our checkpoints and so that they can do their job. Um, uh, second was a technology that, that created a logistics platform, sort of like Grab or Lalamove or Uber, uh, so that donations that come through the Philippines and into our warehouse get to the frontliners. Uh, third was a tracing technology that kind of visualized everything that's coming out of our Department of Health, so people can navigate their way around uh, the pandemic. 
And finally, and most importantly, and excited to, to really deliver this, is to provide relief a God, a God means right away. Uh, and relief is really designed so that we can provide uh, social amelioration to about 18 million people in the Philippines that are hungry uh, and needing help from government. So four projects got kicked off, a thousand developers, lots of chaos, uh, lot, lots of uh, uh, sleepless nights. And you know what's really nice about developers is that then when, when we're here solving problems, I think time just flies and we actually do have a lot of fun working together. So um, obviously extremely well supported by uh, the community here in the Philippines as well in terms of our government and the largest corporations in the country. We then set out to build our projects. So the first one's called Rapid Pass. Uh, it is a technology that uh, provisions QR codes to people that are supposed to leave the homes. Uh, it provides a scanning, a cryptographic scanning technology for uh, checkpoint personnel, police, uh, so that they can scan QR code uh, and, and project it out. Um, and then thirdly, uh, a mechanism of releasing and approving uh, people that are that leave. So in effect, what we did here is we created a platform for the country to decide how much quarantine controls we will have. So immediately we can start with, with maybe half a million people, um, lessen the restriction and open up to about a million and then go back to 250,000 uh, if something happens. Now, the way the solution works, we created a, an application platform built on React uh, and then connected back out into a the, the Microsoft API platform and into a managed uh, database platform in the back end. Uh, on our first week, we had about 100,000 registrations uh, into the system, and these are people that basically talking about who they are, uh, why they're supposed to leave, why they're allowed, sh should be allowed to leave the homes and justify uh, their identities. Second is a platform for the government agencies to actually then approve them uh, and uh, then allow them to print the QR code. So this is fairly interesting for us. We wanted to build a fairly scalable and highly resilient system. So what we did was we encoded the data into the QR code itself and then cryptographically uh, protected it. So with the cryptographic QR codes, we're able to inject the name, the reason why they're uh, allowed to leave the homes, the validity period of the pass. Uh, when there are pictures, we would put in a picture. And, and then finally, um, uh, the location, the, the allowed permission, permitted destinations from their home to their work or from their home to the hospitals, or if they're a, a multi-city service utility people, they're allowed to do that. The key part of this is that we actually, in a couple of iterations, decided to put payload on the QR code. And by putting the payload on the QR code, instead of having the checkpoint devices look up all the time, we were able to deploy the system uh, so that the checkpoints that are outside on the streets uh, are able to then ver verify uh, the, the uh, QR codes without necessarily an internet connection. So that kind of worked out really well for us. Uh, and we deployed the system uh, in a very massive uh, uh, state. So there was about 450,000 applications that came in in a matter of weeks. Uh, we then processed and printed 370,000 QR passes. Uh, we deployed 500 QR, um, QR scanner phones to the police. Uh, we trained about 300 IATF personnel. IATF is people that are manning this, uh, the checkpoints. And now it's, it's in about um, 170 uh, checkpoints. So Quarantine is the only tool we have for COVID since we don't have uh, medicine and vaccine just yet. And this is the tool of the Philippine government actually to ensure that we don't uh, have uh, an outbreak. And so far it's, you know, knock on woods work really well. So we're very excited to have the system. Uh, we've gladly donated all the code back to the government uh, and uh, really excited about uh, where we're going. Um, the work, wasn't just related to software development. We also then deployed the systems. We configured the hardware. Uh, we tested uh, the system on the checkpoints, uh, and uh, we trained the personnel and hand off, handed off the technology back to them. So it was a very involved process that included an end-to-end -end system of enabling the government uh, from that standpoint. And, and the community at DevCon uh, really, really, really stepped up. Um, both in the software we wrote, in the design of the hardware, and the uh, encryption mechanism that we applied, uh, in training the army personnel and police personnel, 
in creating the, the time and motion workflows so that traffic flows in the Philippines, uh, all the way to now handing it off the entire platform to the Philippines, which we now think it's going to become a long-term uh, solution for us. So that's the story of Rapid Pass. It's really what we did uh, here in such a short time. Um, we continued to build more things because we like doing more work. And I guess sleep is overrated. And uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that while we're stuck at home, we're doing some work. So other things we're doing is to, to build a donation platform. So we built uh, a, a mechanism where people can register and pick up the donations. We take a picture and geotag it. Uh, so we know where we picked it up from. The cars then have logistics capability so that uh, as they move on to the destination of the donation, we also take a picture and geotag it uh, so that we ensure that the donations go where they need to go. Um, uh, and then uh, built all of that in, in, in the app as well. So we've been building a lot of, of, of applications. We did a platform to trace COVID. Um, and then finally, uh, releasing in the next few days uh, the philippines needed a platform so that we can provide registration and delivery of uh, relief or uh, help to uh, 18 million for poor filipinos so we built an app uh, that very quickly eliminates the need for paper forms uh, and allow them to apply on their mobile phones and then from their mobile phones uh, they're allowed to identify a mobile wallet or a bank uh, so that they can get their aid from the government uh, and then deploy that pretty quickly. Uh, again, all these solutions are not that complicated, uh, but the issue is large scale mass deployment, very short timelines to do it, uh, and a casual group of people that, you know, normally we just hang out and talk about uh, technology, but it would the first time they really got together and did work. Uh, and delivered something and released and QA'd and cyber checked and, and worked with the government in addition to all of that. Um, so this is how it works. Uh, people uh, in the Philippines, the forms have a barcode, so we scan it first. Uh, and then when uh, disbursement is done in cash, uh, we do take a picture to prove that cash donations or cash amelioration was given, uh, and then it's geotag and sent out uh, to our customers. I wanted to take some time to explain more than just the technology, but the technologists, the geeks, right? And this is really one of the areas that I'm super proud of what we've done, is that we gave an opportunity to a lot of people that wanted to help, that are stuck at home, that wanted to be frontliners, but they're geeks and they're staying in front of their computer. And this is what we did, right? This is an example of John, uh, who enjoyed the time uh, feeling not helpless, but helpful uh, in the government. This is a story of, of, of Janika, uh, who felt like he is a part of the frontliners. Uh, or Ian Emanuel, who's coming from the very far south of the Philippines, who spent a lot of time validating, testing, and, and checking the technology and helping people on how to use it, uh, and acted as a volunteer customer support. Uh, to Michelle, who wanted to make sure that the code we bring works, scales, uh, and is, is protected from, from cyber con concerns. Uh, to Darren, who felt like uh, not only uh, did he help, but he learned and uh, got a lot more skills coming out of doing work for the pandemic. So it's really been really, really exciting, uh, high octane work. Uh, just like Jackie earlier, we, we had a few days uh, to do all the solutions, but to me, the story is is beyond the technology. It's really the people uh, that made it all happen. So um, that's wh that's what we've been doing here in the Philippines. Thank you very much, and I will send this back to our host. Thank you for sharing such inspiring story with us. I'm genuinely amazed uh, by how many people have been together for this project. Um, I haven't found any comments yet, but I have a question for you. Um, so in the QR code, um, the cute health worker image um, caught my eyes. And I'm curious about the number. So is it like unique number? And how does the number generate it? Yeah, so the, the QR code, uh, the, the generation of the QR code uh, creates a control number. So it's a unique random uh, number uh, that people 
can then represent as a QR code, and that's what they scan. Uh, but there mm -hmm. are people in the Philippines that don't have smartphones, so the control numbers is what they verbally say to the checkpoint officer uh, mm -hmm. about their right to pass. So it's kind of like your, your ID. Wow. Um, in the QR code itself, there's a code, uh, actually a, a, a little bit of a code that actually then says what kind of an allowed person you are. So for instance, if it detects that it's a medical personnel, then they get immediate uh, high priority access to the queue mm -hmm. so they can get through the lines pretty quickly. So it was interesting because it was unprecedented. We haven't built any of this ever before <laughs> until COVID uh, and we needed to build it for about a million people. So it's a lot <laughs> uh, that needs to receive all these QR codes. So um, luckily it all worked uh, a little bit challenging at the beginning, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's been now in operational and helping the country control COVID. Yeah, um, I saw a lot of comments, like they really appreciate your presentation. So yeah, great job. Um, I think without technology, people may be use domestic passport book for moving across province in any country. Yes, yes, uh, thank you. And again, wouldn't happen if we didn't have the volunteers and wouldn't be done if, you know, if this crisis and pandemic did not bring out the best in everyone. Uh, in innovation. So, and again, thank you for Microsoft. You were the first um, company that that said you will you will help no matter what, and uh, have have guided us through the project from the very beginning until we released it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so time's up, um, and I it's time to have the next speaker. Ben, thank you, Winston. Yeah, uh, I think almost over 90 people are watching us. Thank you for their and your comments really help us to keep going. Um, so our next speaker is Ben, um, and I can wait, wait to have him. Ben Ishiyama Levy is developer technology MVP based in Singapore. Um, and the passion about John Marin is second to none. I heard he did a cool project to help Microsoft Japan. Please give your full attention to Ben's presentation and hum in welcoming him. Greetings, everyone. How Hi. are you doing? Hi, Olivia. How are you doing? Yeah, you look good. I'm good. Yep, superb. Welcome to Twin Peaks. Uh, this is just like a timeless place, perfect setting for today's conversation. So uh, let me just uh, jump straight into the topic. So my name is Ben. I already introduced uh, what I do and all that. It's fantastic. Uh, so, um, what, what, what happened is just like, about a month and a month and a half back, or maybe two months um, back, one of our clients was involved um, with developing the Blue Trace uh, protocol here in Singapore, which is uh, powering um, the um, Trace Together application, which is basically the COVID-19 tracking app in Singapore. So it is a privacy-preserving cross-border contact tracing protocol. So uh, third parties cannot use Bluetooth, uh, Blue Trace communication to track users over time, limited collection of personal identifiable information, local storage of encounter only, and revocable consent. So the idea is just to keep um, all this information quite private. So, um, well, so um, any user will be able to install the application without much uh, privacy uh, concerns. Sounds good. So that uh, created the Trace to Go the app. Uh, uh, up to a couple of weeks ago, we had about 1.5 million users. It went up um, a little bit. Um, it's built on native Android, Java, and Android Swift for the front end, uh, so uh, mobile. But uh, it's using the Blue Trace protocol that um, um, I just discussed a little while ago. And the back end is on Azure, mostly Azure function and, uh, and some kind of pass uh, repository. So it's all really good. Uh, a lot of us are using this application. Uh, so while um, a little later, Microsoft contacted me uh, uh, to ask me if I wanted to join a similar effort that was being conducted in Japan with Microsoft Japan. Uh, and that uh, the technology used is 100% uh, Microsoft. That means that the um, UI, the mobile front end, will be Xamarin. Well, you may or may not know that, but I love Xamarin, like, like, like a lot. So uh, the name of my company is Xamarinus. That says it all. So um, after a bit of discussion, uh, first of all, we kind, kind of um, wanted to go uh, to present around the information that I already had across 
um, existing project and to make sure that no wheels were going to get in, uh, reinvented. So a little bit of network, network had, um, networking happened. And, uh, and then, yes, I decided to engage not only my expertise, but actually uh, my uh, part of uh, one, one team uh, from my company uh, to help out. Uh, luckily, I run a company in Singapore, and what we do is developing um, cloud native and Xamarin application. So we just took a team and say, "Hey, do you uh, let, let, let's just like help um, this project like for like uh, uh, two weeks or so in order to give uh, to give a good spec in order to basically um, uh, hammer all the Xamarin um, part of it and just help out on the site." So uh, we did absolutely just that. Um, so we took the project management for this spike uh, over uh, with our project manager uh, and uh, allocated task uh, for Xamarin as your function development, UI testing and, um, and DevOps. Uh, so that went pretty well. Uh, again, the tech, uh, tech stack for this application was Xamarin Forms, iOS and Android, uh, using Xamarin Forms shell in order just to uh, leverage, uh, you know, like the, all, all the heavy lifting for you. Uh, so the development uh, will go a bit faster and we don't have to spend too much time uh, on doing all this piping. Backend, Azure Functions, Cosmos DB, uh, Bits and Bobs. Um, and then uh, we set in place the test coverage, So, uh, which I will demonstrate. I will do a live demo in one second. Um, the, um, with Xamarin, we use App Center UI test uh, plus a BDD layer on top of it, and then set up the backend uh, and unit unit test. And also our esteemed uh, fellow MVP, uh, Chaminda, uh, set in place the bulk of the CI CD um, using Azure DevOps and App Center. So all, all very nice. Let me just take uh, one second to show something that we've been doing, which is um, goes along with one on the um, kind of open source library that we are um, uh, Sourcing. We'll go through later. So you can see on my right hand side, it is a COVID radar application from Japan, which uh, can be used for uh, be used by by any country. Right? We uh, have resource files, so that's uh, easy just to um, to set up. If your country wants uh, to have a COVID app, it doesn't have one yet. Just grab this one. It works um, uh, very very nicely. So uh, this is your home screen, and if you click on start, uh, you'll get a bit of information, and then you can uh, keep going. On, on your um, onboarding. So what I will do is I would like to test how that works. So uh, in order to test how um, I can get that working, I'm going to create a very simple a cucumber uh, scenario. So, and that is going to go along the line, given I can see a label with a text COVID-19 radar, which is what you can see here on this mobile application. Uh, then I can see a start button. You can see a start button down here. And when I tap on the stop button, uh, then I, I can see on how it works page. So again, I'm going to click and you can see on the top, it says how it works. And then I can see a label with uh, a number one and a label with a number two. So that's something very, very basic. But ultimately what I want to do is to run that. So I'm going just to close the application, get my mouse back, and I'm going to be running uh, this unit test. Uh, and that will be very, very quickly. So it takes a package of the Android application, which is uh, on the code here. And let me show you the output here. It's going to basically go through all those elements. I am not touching the screen. My hands are on my head. Uh, so I'm not doing anything at all. Let's see if I can see. Yep, see, hands up. I'm not touching anything. I'm proving it. So you can see the application is running by itself. And you can see that still my, my hand is up. I'm just touching my mouse. And there we go. And um, the application has been launched. And we'll be able to see a bit of output. You can see that everything is running. It's validating that everything works. And the test is green. So that's fantastic. This is called UI testing. Um, that has been open source. That's running on top of Xamarin uh, UI test. Um, and uh, that allows you to do some Cucumber by just doing zero, zero code. Um, very useful. So uh, there we go. So the application went very well. Uh, that uh, is planned to be released in Japan. Uh, pretty soon, they're talking with the government right now to see the uh, fine details. Uh, and uh, on the fun facts, we've been interviewed by uh, the Japanese national television, NHK, about this application. So um, that is cool. We still have uh, our one hand uh, on it, and we're still providing some updates uh, when required. So now let's talk quickly about centralized versus decentralized application. Uh, when it comes to contact tracing. So the decentralized application, for instance, is going to take pretty much the info 
information uh, that is uh, not your identity, just your identifier when you register with the application, and then take uh, every time you meet uh, somebody that has the application that may or may not be infected, whatever, uh, the, uh, this anonymous data will be coming also to your device and the processing is going to be done there while maybe taking some more information from the database. But the crucial point is uh, the processing is done on your device, not on the cloud. The centralized um, uh, version instead is going to be uh, on um, done all on the cloud. So the data is going to be saved to the database and then processed there. So uh, that is two approaches. So one may say that the decentralized version might be a little bit more uh, cool when it comes, again, just to, sensitive, to data and sensitive information, although everything is, de is anonymized, but well. So uh, why am I talking about that? Well, I'm going to uh, go through that very quickly. Bluetooth on iOS got some limitations. So you take Bluetooth plus you add a little bit of iOS and a little bit of background processes. And what you get is a bang because Facebook does not work properly when in the background um, because of the way Apple restriction um, of, of Bluetooth. So now what happens? Uh, Apple uh, just tell the uh, uh, companies or organizations that have been creating some tracing application. We are cool just to uh, relax a little bit uh, the way we handle uh, background processing, but we don't want to do that with centralized application. We want to only do that with decentralized application. So as long as you are decentralized, then we're cool, we'll be able just to relax that. So that was a case that um, you may have read the news, but that just happened quite recently. So uh, obviously uh, the entities that have uh, been uh, doing a centralized way of building application, we'll go back to decentralized in order to uh, make the iOS uh, tracing possible. So um, on, on the cool stuff, so um, Google and Apple, you probably heard the news as well, decided for once to work together uh, in order to uh, create an exposure notification API, which allows to uh, get the problem out of the box mechanism for developer to do some contact tracing. So there is no restriction. It just works out of the box. It's just like super safe. And that's great. That means that developers can take that and then integrate that into this application, which is precisely what is being done uh, to the Japanese application that, um, that we've been working on. Um, so that, that's great. And uh, because uh, they got that in place, obviously Xamarin, uh, which I am uh, quite fond of, decided ahead of time, as soon as they got the specification, even if nothing was done on the Apple and Google side, they went ahead and said, here we go. At least we can give you the stub, which is basically the uh, API that you will need to uh, consume whenever all that is ready. And now they've got the project uh, going, which is this Xamarin exposure notification, which is a cross-platform way of consuming this SDK for contact tracing. And again, because it's Xamarin, you just write it once, deploys everywhere, everywhere. no need to look at the uh, uh, Android or iOS specific implementation. Just do it once, and that will just work out of the box. So uh, that is uh, how the uh, using this uh, new protocol, this is how basically an application would be looking at. So uh, you've got the onboarding on the left-hand side, as recommended by Apple and Google and a positive result flow that just gets into then a, um, the exposure notification. So if uh, we know that you've been working not far away with an infected uh, person, then you'll be able just to see that path and then you'll have your notification setting. So um, that is that provides a very simple, easy framework to build your own COVID application. Um, in, in terms of um, open source as well, uh, Xamariners, uh, my, my company and, and myself do quite a lot of those projects, uh, so both in uh, in GitHub and um, uh, on on NuGet, some are pretty pretty popular. But we are releasing like a bunch of end-to-end -end and unit testing libraries, all working in a codeless fashion using um, using BDD. So these uh, little. Uh, text that I uh, showed a bit earlier. Then I can see something and I tap on something else and that happens. So that allows QA team to actually, um, well, just uh, pr pr produce uh, uh, test cases without coding and that will work um, we, uh, using a uh, real application. And we are uh, proposing that on a, as an end-to-end -end for Xamarin, end-to-end -end for web application, especially Blazor, Blazor, which is also part uh, of the uh, .NET, uh, SP.NET Core uh, family that allows using, um, again, Cucumber to uh, run uh, some uh, very, very easily without any code, uh, some end-to-end um, uh, -end UI testing. And we also do that for unit testing for Xamarin and also for Blazor and for a bunch of stuff. I will blog about that pretty soon. I think this is all for my talk. Any questions? And I'm probably on time as well, hopefully.
Am I? Olivia? Anyone? Hello. I believe I am all alone. Can anyone hear me? <laughs> Hello, Ben. <clears throat> Sorry for waiting. Oh, yeah. no Thank reason. you for um, sharing your project with us. Um, yeah. So I think it's more meaningful that we use the open source with this. Um, and I heard that you are also on media about your co project the other day. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So we we got a uh, film uh, remotely um, as a basically we're conducting what we are doing during um, uh, um, or spike or two weeks spike, which is conducting a daily stand up, and we use that as a narrative in order to show the different aspects um, um, that are marrying both open source decentralization uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and there were other parts that um, that uh, constitute software development. What is uh, interesting and that we highlighted is the way we can just work together now seamlessly is really, really new. Uh, it was unheard of. So when, when you think about open source, let's say like 10, 15, 20 years ago, well, that was a bunch of people that were usually on the same company or on the same university just doing a project together and that will be just like super localized and, and that's it. Now somebody in Japan started something and then you got the people from Singapore, people from all over the, play, uh, the world, doesn't matter where you are, you can just, uh, you've got a flow, a way of working, the tooling that allows it. And, and that is really, really cool. So open source is changing, has changed dramatically. Tooling is getting better. GitHub is awesome. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that allows to do this kind of project and really in a really reactive manner, when something bad happens, like what uh, we're experiencing these days, well, the world is just set to light and all the open source people go around saying, yes, we can do it. We're going just to do something. And we had like already two talks about it. And that was really empowering. Uh, and humbling just to hear that again, just like hundreds, tens, dozens, thousands, whatever, a certain amount of people want together in order to build something to make the world better, uh, one one uh, line of code at a time. Yeah, um, I have some comments here. And then, yeah, Green is looking forward to having a look at the code. The code for uh, for COVID, uh, it's, a, it's a presentation, but that is uh, uh, if you can go back, the code. Uh, well, if you, if you, yeah, well, can I put a comment in? I suppose. You'll be, you'll uh, be, you'll be able yes, to yeah. share the presentation later on our GitHub. Yeah, right? yeah. it's all in the presentation. Yeah. All the references are there, so that that will yeah. be simple. Yeah, and then we have another comment uh, from Georgie. Can you say more about the centralized nature of the, your app? Is it a CPU intensive network or something else? Uh, well, that uh, ultimately uh, now we are piggybacking back into the Apple slash uh, Google uh, protocol because it's just there. It's a, it's it's easy packed and it goes around the um, again nature of the restriction of the Apple um, uh, Bluetooth restriction. So backgrounding is not working really well. So uh, is it CPU intensive? Ultimately, not really because you simply need to. Um, uh, calculate the time you spend uh, in the proximity of somebody that's a very small amount of data and then join the dots so that's that that's okay that works well that is well suited to uh, to mobile application you know uh, mobile phones are just like little computers as long as you even even like pretty decent machine learning models run fine on it just so a little bit of of graph querying is it's a piece of cake but it's yeah. fine um, if if you have more comments uh, about his presentation, you can connect with Ben with the Twitter handle on the screen, right? Yeah. Right. Sure, yeah. sure. And you can my email that is on my presentation, just like um, drop me your line and uh, I'll answer. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ben. Sayonara. <laughs> have a good day. We have Kongpan from. Thailand, and we have a Winston from Philippines, and we have Ben from Singapore. Um, you might not notice, but almost one hour has passed. So to be able to enjoy the rest, we prepared a fun session with Women of Code and Azure Community. For those who missed our announcement earlier, so we have the Dev Challenge. Basically, you can follow them exercising and just tweet your photo or video on Twitter with hashtag DevSpeak. And you can earn the virtual swag, which is $50 of Move 
for sure. Staying fit from your seat. Let's invite Priyanka, Amok, and Isha, and the rest of the community members. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, good. I'm good. I, I'm really excited to invite all of virtual attendees to our ex exercise session. Are you ready? Uh, Amok had to leave because he had a, he had a meeting from 3 o'clock. So since we overshot our duration, he had to leave. Okay, that happened. I, I'm yeah. I'm so proud. <laughs> yeah, let's move. Okay, let's go. Glitch. Yep, I'm sorry, it's a bit frozen at this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, for you, you like continue on your end, like, uh, you know, perhaps I'll just stop sharing my screen. Yep, sure, sure. Just, just let's do the uh, the stretching, the the arm stretching. Yep, and uh, move it over to the opposite. Okay, then uh, let's uh, uh, let's do the leg raises, leg raise movements. Okay, this is a bit difficult for me, but yeah. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Okay. 
Okay, that's all guys for the five minute stretch. That's the stretch. Great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. Thank you for joining right. us. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, now okay. we have stretched, so we are good to go. Um, now, two experts are waiting for you to share useful tips to help you to go through this quarantine life. Let me invite the first speaker, Chloe Condon. She is cloud advocate at Microsoft and popular figure on social. She will be sharing tips on building your career and network while being fully remote. Welcome. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, I'm so Chloe. excited. How are you? It's early in the morning there. It's it's midnight here, so oh, I'm having a little a little party. I did a little stretch party for my neighbors. Kept it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, despite the time zone, different time. Zone. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so it's it's your time. Great. Okay, so I have my slides up here. Um. I am super excited to talk to you all about building your career remotely, since we're all kind of doing that right now. Um, it's a very interesting time. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Chloe Condon, and I work as a cloud advocate at Microsoft, which is a pretty unique role. Um, I get to engage with developer communities in a lot of different ways. Typically, that involves anything from uh, going to different meetups or traveling to different conferences. Of course, I'm not doing that now, and most of my engagement engagement is being done through social, so through different kind of online engagement. So I put together this presentation um, with that in mind, that we're all home, and there's really no way for us to go out and shake hands and mingle and, and meet people face to face. So these are my tips and tricks for how you can build your career remotely from the comfort of your own home, and maybe even from your own couch in sweatpants, if that's the way that you choose to do it. So um, I'd like to start out by just talking about the word networking. I don't know about y'all, but networking is not a word that I particularly like. It kind of makes me cringe a little bit when I think about, ooh, networking. Um, so networking helps us do a lot of really amazing things. But for the sake of this talk, and maybe you picked up on the theme from this GIF here, if you're a fan of friends, we're gonna think about networking, not as networking. Just forget about that word. It's a yucky word. We don't wanna think about it. Um, we're going to think of it as friend making and just stay with me here. I promise it makes sense. <laughs> so uh, here I've got my friends image here. So think about networking more like friend making. So friend making and networking can connect you to jobs. Um, personally, myself, I've gotten a lot of job opportunities through different friends um, that I've met through the community. It can help you find like-minded people in the industry. So maybe you're really passionate about IoT or you really like to do maker things or maybe you're really, really into Kubernetes right now. You can find those communities online. Um, it can introduce you to new communities. Um, personally, as, as I mentioned before, uh, when I came into tech, I was totally unfamiliar with the maker space. And I've gotten really involved with the makerspace through different online communities I've joined. 
Um, it can help you find mentorship and career advice. So a lot of people that maybe you would typically think, oh, I, I usually go onto LinkedIn or I um, send a, a cold email to someone to reach out to who I really respect and look up to. You can actually find a lot of those mentors and get career advice through these social media platforms. Um, friend making, much like networking, can be a support system. So maybe you are in an underrepresented group in tech, like myself, I'm a woman in tech, um, or maybe you're even just looking for folks who, a support system sometimes when you're banging your head against the wall on a particular API that you're working on that day. Um, and it can also introduce you to new opportunities. I know right now is, is kind of an interesting time to be job searching, but many of us are out there. Um, and you can actually find a lot of really interesting opportunities that may not be listed on a typical job page um, or, or accessible by cold applying. You can actually find a lot of people posting about jobs um, through your friend network. Get it? Friend network. I combined both of them. <laughs> so I have a couple tips here on how to be uh, authentic and professional when you are on social media. Um, so what you share in your profiles online, so I'm talking Twitter, personal website, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram tend to be a little bit more personal, but they're still sort of our business card that represents us on the internet. Um, you really want your profiles online to, to, you want to think of them almost as your digital business card. Um, so my tips and tricks here are you really want to make sure that you're representing yourself uh, appropriately online. So I know there's a tendency sometimes to have a cartoon or an avatar um, of yourself, but especially when you're job searching, having that human actual photo of you there can be a really, really great way to humanize the person on the other end. Um, personally, I attend a lot of conferences and, and I'll meet people. People and they'll say, oh, it's me, you know, Danger 5000 from Twitter, you know, I'm, I'm the dog cartoon. And of course, I don't have the digital memory association of a dog cartoon with the person. So having your image up there is a really, really great way to kind of be, be human, humanize yourself on the internet. Um, so try, try to make your image not a cartoon, not your baby, not your dog, even though your dog or your baby is super cute, not your favorite meme. Make it you because it's really a represent. It's it's representative of who you are on the internet, um, and then also I have a great example here. So this is um, an example I I love to show. This is my friend Kimberly's personal website. Um, you really want to make sure that what you have on there, be that your Twitter bio, be that your Instagram bio, be that your LinkedIn, but especially your personal website to really represent who you are. Um, I love Kimberly's example as a great example because she says her name. Kimberly Johnson, and she says, hi there, I'm a full stack software engineer. I already know who this person is and what she does. Um, she, of course, here has this carousel uh, that has um, a bunch of different projects that she features, including her Twitter and, and, and recent um, projects she's collaborated with with Twilio. She's got her portfolio, her resume, her blog on here. So really, it's a one-stop shop to know who this person is, what they're all about. And what's great about a personal website you can link it in your Twitter bio and in your Instagram bio. So that way, if people want to learn more about you, besides what you're limited to in a bio, you can go there. Um, so beyond that, there's a couple other tips that I think are worth mentioning about being a good participant on the internet, so to speak. So friendship, much like networking, takes effort. So um, there's, there's a common saying, you know, you have to give as much to the friendship as, as you receive. And I think that's really true with being someone online interacting, especially with digital communities like we all are doing now. So it's not enough to just like and view content, especially on platforms like Twitter. Um, engaging with folks online and getting involved in the conversations online are really the key element of being able to build that network or friend group, like we're going to call it in this talk. Um, so a really, really cool example of this, which is a personal example that happened to me that I would love to share with y'all, is a tweet that I wrote. Let's see. This is oh, almost exactly a year ago. So I tweeted this and I said, this was just kind of a silly tweet that I wrote. I was playing Mario Kart with my boyfriend and I wrote, in my opinion, your chosen Mario Kart player says way more than your Zodiac sign does. If they choose Toad, you're like, okay, you're an introvert. 
And if they choose Bowser, you're like, okay, who hurt you? So of course, this is sort of a joking tweet, but as you can see, it went pretty viral. It had a bunch of retweets and likes. And the comments turned into this really funny discussion of people asking me, oh, I usually play as, you know, peach cat, you know, uh, what does that say about me? Or I usually play as dry bones. What does that character say about me? And of course, I was responding to these and giving kind of joke responses. But what was really cool is the community kind of came together here. So after I posted this, um, among many of the comments that were on there, uh, this person who I do not know, I only know him from the internet, named Steven, um, started a, a Google Doc spreadsheet of all the answers that I was giving. And I thought it was, you know, like a fun, interesting thing to kind of do. And then it got more traction. And then he created this wonderful um, GitHub pages site. It was just using some open source um, CSS libraries called NES CSS and uh, basically made this template that I could put all of these um, answers that I was giving in there. So this is a complete stranger on the internet, a really great example of, you know, when, when strangers come together and really make something fun. So from this, um, this actually inspired a project that I ended up doing, um, which used Mario Kart uh, to determine what your zodiac sign was using the face API. So um, it was kind of a really wonderful example of the internet um, kind of friendship network coming together. Uh, and I love I love sharing this example because you truly never know when you are online, be it in a forum, be it on Twitter, be it, you know, if people are still using MySpace, MySpace, Facebook, wherever it may be, there's so many wonderful developer communities online. And it may, we're always told growing up, especially, you know, if you're my age with the internet, don't talk to strangers, but I'm telling you here, talk to strangers. There's some really wonderful, wonderful people out there. Um, so, which leads me to my next point. Don't invest in bad friendships. We've all had one of those bad friends, but specifically in this case, I mean, don't feed the trolls um, and, and don't be a troll. Uh, I think that kind of goes without saying, but unfortunately, some people do need a reminder. Uh, I, of course, as a woman on the internet with many followers, I experience a lot of trolls. This happens. And I encourage you um, to not feed the trolls. And really what that means is a lot of times it's tempting to engage and fight and banter about things. I think a wonderful heated discussion about what the best API to do a project is, is a great time to, to have a little small argument about technology. But when it comes to anything that has to do, um, of course, we have a wonderful code of conduct for, for this particular uh, presentation that we're doing. But always remember, anything you put on the internet is out there forever. Screenshots exist. You can always delete a tweet, but you can't really take back anything you say or put on the internet. So always be kind. Be nice to everyone. Shut down any bad behavior you see other people doing. Being a good community member really means don't be a troll and especially don't feed the trolls. Um, took me a long time to learn that lesson as well, but really the trolls just want to engage. Um, where do I find friends? On Netflix. You guys seeing a the theme with my slides? Totally have a friends theme here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You can find friends everywhere. Um, I personally have met some uh, very, very wonderful friends who have ended up being my real life friends that I've met in person over the years um, through Twitter, through uh, Instagram, through all sorts of different sources. Um, I think it's a really, we live in a really interesting age and especially while we're all sheltering in place right now where we can have really authentic, unique interactions and experiences with complete strangers online. Um, so here you're probably thinking, but Chloe, how should I start? Great question. <laughs> So um, I would start by finding and following people that you admire. So be that around a particular technology, be that around, you know, maybe you really like this engineer's projects that they're doing, or be um, maybe you're a really big fan of Microsoft, so you want to follow a bunch of cloud advocates. That's a wonderful way to start, uh, just to plug my own team here. But um, that's one way to do it, joining online and virtual meetups. So congratulations, you're already doing friend making by being in this talk right now. Um, um, reaching out. I know it can be really scary to DM people and reach out to people, especially strangers, but guess what? It's way easier online. And the worst thing that happens is they don't respond. <laughs> so um, it's a really, really, uh, if there's particular people out there that maybe you want to have mentor you or have, you know, a one-on-one -on -one digital coffee date, just make sure that when you message them, um, and I'll, I'll be able to, to tweet an article about this later, really know 
spell out what you want to talk to them about, what you would want advice on. Um, just picking someone's brain can sometimes be a little vague. So be specific with your ask. Um, ask around. If maybe you're like, oh, I, I really want to get more involved in open source. A great way to find wonderful open source communities is to ask your, uh, your current friend network. And if you don't know anybody in your friend network who may be able to direct you there, tweet something out there. Um, if you can't find what you're looking for, create your own community. Now, I will warn you, community building takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of watering that garden, so to speak. But there's truly a community for everything if you look hard enough, which my final, uh, what my second to last slide here, um, I have a really, uh, if you're not really interested in being on Twitter all the time and looking for the communities and finding the right hashtags, and maybe you just want to automate this for yourself. Um, I actually made a video recently that you can check out at aka.ms slash show and tell one. It's a very short and sweet video about 10 to 12 minutes long. And I walk through with my coworker, Jay, how you can build a very, very simple Azure Logic app, doesn't involve any code whatsoever, um, that will actually create a Slack channel of a specific hashtag. So let's say that you really want to learn more about volumetric or HoloLens, or maybe you want to learn just more about mixed reality. You can actually create a Slack channel that will send you all of the uh, tweets out there that are getting hashtagged with that. So that way you don't have to scroll through and be on Twitter all the time and you can get these notifications kind of in the background um, and it can kind of automate and make your life easier. So I think that is most of the time that I have. Um, I will see you on the internet. You are now all of my internet friends and I'm super, super excited to see uh, all of you get involved with your online communities. All righty, I'm going to take any questions if there are any questions, but also my DMs are open on Twitter. My handle is at Chloe Condon on the slide here. So any sort of tips and tricks you're looking for, um, I can definitely share that out with y'all. Thank you, Chloe. Um, this is really extremely helpful. Um, and then I think you have an important point that like if you go to community um, for the first time and then if you don't feel comfortable yourself, then you can create um, the community. Maybe um, it's not your fault, but you know, it's just that there is no community to speak for you. So yeah, I really like your presentation. Yeah, uh, maybe you also, have a community of people who wear NASA hats. You can start your <laughs> own community. <laughs> right. Um, for, personally, um, the tweet, um, you said, uh, we are all home. It's okay to be scrappy. Let's be real. Um, gave me really a big comfort, you know, during this quarantine. Yeah, and I think it's it's really important that, you know, the reality is we're all at home and we're all kind of in this together. It's a very unique moment in time where we're all experiencing all over the world the same thing together. So I think it's it's a really unique opportunity to engage with, with other people online and in digital communities. I'm an ambivert, which is an introverted extrovert. So I still kind of crave that that face-to-face -face human connection, wow. of course, but it's a good opportunity to um, build your own online communities. Yeah, I don't think I can um i can how to say understand that you are introvert you look <laughs> extremely introvert <laughs> i can turn it on and off it's yeah it's the, yeah. It's the acting background <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right um so like before i guess we feel very ashamed to like show our like you know poor like home or something like that but so we put a lot of virtual background but now I think people feel okay to show this as it is, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's kind of fun to see, you know, right. it's a unique time where we can see people's dogs and kids and right. cats. And <laughs> yeah. So more fun and inspiring tweets on Chloe Condon. So you can find her on Twitter. And thank you for your presentation today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I lost um can we chloe back uh, i got the question now <laughs> sorry chloe no, <laughs> sorry the question sorry um so you can see the question on the screen so my online presence has always been my allies but i'm trying to put more effort into my technical blog would you suggest i switch to my actual details as per your friend's example 
Yeah, I guess it depends on the scenario. I think that when it comes to hiring specifically, being able to kind of attribute that blog post or whatever it is, the content that you're putting out to a person is always helpful. But if you prefer being anonymous or being under an alias, that's totally fine. Just know it's a little bit trickier um, at having been a, a recruiter in a past life to kind of be able to connect the dots with those things. So either spell that out really clearly when you're applying to jobs or, or networking with folks, or you know if that means maybe linking it in, in your profile in a certain way. But um, yeah, I, I definitely don't want to discourage people from going under an alias because I've certainly uh, dabbled in that in the past as well. But I think um, as authentic as you can be in kind of being a part of these communities, the better, because then you kind of are able to put a face to the name. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, and then uh, I have to say one thing about the Dev Challenge. Um, so we have Dev Challenge and we still have the $50 of LO moves for sure for you. So if I were you, because I'm into LinkedIn right now, so I'm gonna like to set a sub timer and then maybe I'm gonna take my photo of this and then join the Dev Challenge. Why don't you join the Dev Challenge right now? Um, the virtual swag is waiting for you. Um, all right, no time to dilly dally. Tingji Ko is waiting for us. Um, Tingji is a co-founder of Connected Women Hong Kong and a co-founder of Script and C. If you like the stickers, you should visit the website. So let's um, put your hands together and welcome Tingji. <laughs> Um, for the introduction, Olivia, I'm super happy to be here to um, share my experience with everyone. Hello, Ting Ji. It's all yours. Oh, great. Thank you. So um, I'll jump into my presentation here. Second. So I guess I just wanted to start it um, by giving a little bit of background about myself so you understand the context to the journey that I've been on. Um, I'm originally from Canada, from Nova Scotia, if anyone actually knows where that is, um, super small province. My family is from Hong Kong and I moved here about 12 years ago. I'm married and I actually have two young daughters. So they're actually out of the apartment right now, which is why it is actually quiet at the moment. So um, I have a daughter who is two and I have another one that is one month old. So if there are any other parents out there who are working from home, um, I think you probably definitely understand where I'm coming from when I say that life is survival at the moment. Um, and I'll, that kind of gives you a bit of um, idea when we talk about um, tips in terms of working remotely. In terms of my background, um, I actually started my tech career about seven years ago. So I helped build a startup here in Hong Kong called The Entertainer, which kind of worked in the same sphere as Groupon, if you remember that business. And then after that, I moved on to Apple and to LinkedIn, where I did corporate sales. So one of the projects that I've been working on on the side um, is actually what we call Connected Women Hong Kong. So it actually kind of links really well to what Chloe was just talking about. Um, when I did this really great mentoring program at the Women's Foundation here in Hong Kong, which is an NGO, it really inspired me to want to give back to the female community here. And it wasn't until I actually got to LinkedIn um, where they had these amazing resources and, you know, in terms of space and opportunities to meet people where I met these like minded women um, from Uber and Google, uh, Microsoft and Facebook. And we kind of came together as a small team of 10 women and we decided that we wanted to do something to give back. And so essentially Connected Women is really about um, meaningful connections. So again, going back to what Chloe said, Networking to me is also a super scary word. When I think about it, I think about standing by the bar and having a drink by myself because I'm super shy. Um, so we wanted to create meaningful connections where people could talk to other women, um, whether, it about, whether it's about personal growth, um, career development, or you know, finding job opportunities in other industries. Um, and finally, the third thing is working around um, NGOs and charities in Hong Kong and giving back to women who are in need. So last year, um, we actually started the community um, in March, I believe. And throughout the, the next kind of nine, 10 months, what we did was we started doing these really awesome events. So we started with LinkedIn and we, are, we did a session on teaching women how to build their professional brand on LinkedIn. Um, from there, Microsoft did this awesome tea ses um session, which actually incorporated AI. So understanding how AI actually works in the real world. Um, and then Facebook did an awesome, um, really great event around personal finance. So unlike, you know, actually, actually like, like myself, I actually 
feel that I shy away a lot from personal um, investment and finance, and I feel like I don't know a lot about it. And so this was really about teaching women how to gain a threshold in that and how to really kind of take charge and control of their own finances. And then finally, Uber did this really great event on mental health and wellness. So the other um, project that I've been doing, um, which you can see in my handle at Script and C, it's actually an online store. So my sister and I uh, were inspired by our travels. We used to travel all the time and we used to go to different stationery stores to buy stickers for ourselves. So yes, I'm an adult sticker collector. Um, and this kind of idea is what started us in terms of thinking of starting our own store and buying our own um, stickers and selling them to people who were journalers or um, you know, creatives out there. And so it started as a passion project and we started talking about it in December of last year. And over three months, we launched on April 1st. So I guess I like to say that I actually gave birth twice um, this year because April 1st we launched and then on April 2nd I actually had my daughter. So um, that kind of gives you an idea of what the last couple of months have been like in our house. It's been really crazy. So that kind of takes me into the tips that I wanted to share. Everyone's situation is different, obviously. If you have kids or you don't, um, you know, if you have kids or you don't, I think that these tips will be able to apply to you as well. So I guess the first one I want to talk about is creating a routine. Um, I know, again, this is not rocket science. This is really logical and really basic. But, you know, there was definitely a time where my husband and I kind of realized after five days that we actually hadn't left our apartment and we hadn't done anything. So I think it's super important to keep in your mindset that you're going to work, right? So you separate your work day from your weekend. So it's getting up, having a shower, changing your clothes. Um, if you have the luxury of having a specific work area in your house, that's great. Cause obviously in Hong Kong, um, space is at a premium, but if you can do that, then go for it because it helps you kind of make sure that Monday doesn't melt into Saturday and you actually know what day of the week it is. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is creating a schedule. So I know that this probably looks really intense. Um, my husband says that I'm really high strung. I like to say I'm anal, more organized. Um, my schedule is really important to me because it helps me to keep on track and reminds me of the things that I value the most and where I want to spend my time. So, you know, the things that I want to focus on during this period are my family, my marriage, um, my kids, you know, my friends, my business, my personal growth, um, also leisure time and health. And you can kind of see how I block that out. And again, it, nothing is ever perfect, right? Um, do I get to follow the schedule every single day? And is it to a T? Absolutely not. But at least it kind of keeps me on my toes and gives me a structure to work around. So you can kind of see here how I built out my time in terms of where I spend, you know, time with my kids and my business. And um, even when we were working in corporate offices, you know, I never believed that bums in seats equals productivity. You know, for me, I know that if I can block out two to three hours, if I'm lucky, that that might might be all that I actually need um, for a day of work. So it really depends on how you work, how efficient you are, how productive you are. Um, that kind of leads me into saying, you know, how do you work? When are you the most productive? And it's really about thinking, OK, do I have the highest energy in the morning or am I more of a night owl? Um, how do you schedule your calls, your Zoom calls? Um, so for my sister and I, she actually is based in Toronto and I'm here. So we're working across oceans, but also time zones. So every week we have a call that lasts for three hours and it's the same time every week. So there is no excuse to miss it. Um, and during that call, we talk about anything and everything we prep for it. So we're efficient in terms of our use of time. And then we really divide and conquer. So it's really looking at strengths, right? So my sister did a lot of the back end work when we built out our website, um, a lot more of the technical stuff. Whereas I worked more on our social media, um, you know, sourcing our products, setting up our admin and our business. Um, so more on the operational side. Exploring new ways to work. So um, this is something that actually inspired our business as well. It's called the bullet journal. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but essentially it's, you know, a mindfulness practice disguised as a productivity system. And I'm the kind of person who writes everything down. So this is a super analog, um, but I had notes on my laptop, on my phone. I had it in a notebook on sticky notes, and I really needed a place where I could put everything in one place so I could see it all and give me a good macro perspective of how I'm spending my time and how productive I am. So um, this is what I actually use now, and it helps me to prepare for every day, every week, every month, and really what I need to focus on. And at the end of every day, it gives me an opportunity to really reflect, because I think it's important to remember that 
you know, how you spend your days or really how you spend your life. And it's really important because if you kind of do things just by, you know, watching Netflix or um, sitting on the sofa, time goes by and that's your life. So it's really important to think about what you value and how you want to spend it. Um, then I talk about change of scenery. Um, in Hong Kong, we're really lucky, um, like, you know, the US and Canada, where it's been a really intense lockdown, we can still go to cafes, we can go to restaurants, we can still see friends. So if you can um, get out, you know, change your scenery, change work environments so that it keeps things fresh, it keeps you motivated, keeps you focused. Um, because yeah, it's super easy to go from your desk to your sofa and watch Netflix and go back and wear your pajamas all day. Um, but you know, at some point we will go back to the real world. We will get back to working in office and it's good to keep yourself on your toes. So that kind of leads me to moving. Um, again, I think I'm definitely um, guilty of this as well, where I've just kind of stayed in the entirety and not gone out. But moving, you know, obviously increases endorphins and it's about, you know, keeping your mind fresh and keeping you focused. Taking a break for yourself is super important. So like I said before, I don't believe that sitting in front of a laptop for eight hours really means productivity. It doesn't mean it's the best use of your time. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. So what I mean by this is that, you know, as a mom, I've definitely had a lot of mom guilt when I think about how I spend my time. You know, I feel guilty for spending a lot of time on my business and building it out and not enough with my kids. And, you know, I realize that I have to be kind to myself and that the tomorrow is a new day. So you know, if people are late to Zoom meetings, if work hasn't been done on time, you know, remember that everyone kind of has a struggle, whether it was before, during or after this virus, right? So um, keeping that in mind will help you manage your own stress and also help you build your relationships, which kind of takes me to my second last slide, which is really just about, um, you know, having compassion. Um, so making sure that you remember that, you know, everyone is struggling in some way, whether it is financially, um, whether it is not being able to come back home to see their family and being stuck in another country, whether someone is ill, um, the stress of a job, you know, stress of crazy kids running around, whatever it is. So um, always really important to kind of keep that in mind. And then my last slide to basically wrap it up, it's just a quick summary to talk about the tools. Again, this is not, um, you know, reinventing the wheel or anything. This is really about what I did to kind of get me through the hardest times of building a business with a husband who works from home, with two children who are running around, um, you know, working remotely with someone who is in a different time zone from me. But again, it's really about your specific situation. And I hope that from these tools, you'll be able to take something for yourself that will help you kind of work through this, um, this environment. So thank you. Thank you. Um, for um, sharing the really nice tips with us. I um, mean, I think the how you spend your day is how you spend your lives really hit the nail on my head, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think about um, that all the time too. Yeah, and also we have some comments here then by Sujan. Um, I did the bullet journaling for a while and I must say it was really helpful in increasing the productivity. Uh, yeah, I love it. It's I've been using that bullet journal for years now. Um, writing things down, I find, is how I actually remember things the most. And again, it's really about the reflection, I think. Just looking at every day, like, what did I do today? How did I spend this time? So that's super important for me. Right. Um, and also, we have a question uh, from Deepak. What was the biggest challenge for you when working from home and how did you overcome uh, oh man, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, to be really, really honest, just before this call, my daughter had a complete meltdown. My newborn infant daughter, you know, had a poo-poo and we had to change her nappy and I had to get everyone out of the house before this call started. So those challenges come in all the time. Um, and all you can kind of do is just remember that this is life. Nothing is ever going to be perfect. Um, I try to count to 10. Sometimes I give myself an adult timeout, a breather for myself. The other thing I was saying is that I also, if you have the luxury, we have helpers in Hong Kong, obviously. Um, she's helped me a lot. I can just kind of go to a cafe and work for a couple hours and come back. Um, but if you don't, you know, if you can find like a, a safe space in your house where you can do your own thing for a little while, I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, thank you for today. And I, when I, I feel really sad when you said mom guilt, but <sighs> accept that as it is and then it's really relatable that you have to be kind yourself right totally i think um 
after I had kids, I really realized the challenges that moms go through. Before, when I was single and you know married, even without kids, I never really, not that I didn't respect moms, but I just never knew the gravity that moms hold. Mm -hmm. um, and moms are amazing, I think. So working from home and taking on the responsibility of teaching your children, doing online classes while trying to build a business, while managing a household, um, is extremely challenging, you know, and you have to be kind to yourself. You have to give yourself some time to read, to go, you know, do a facial, whatever it is that you need to kind of make yourself feel better. Yeah. Sure for everyone who working from home with the fighting for the all the obstacles. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this will be the last panel talk we have prepared. Um, we wanted to deliver hopeful messages to the community um, with the leaders who have experienced tragedy before, but overcame with um, home word, warm heart and um, empathy. So I can't wait to invite the panels. But first, let me have the moderator, Susan Chen. Hi, hello. Hi. How was yeah. your workout? It was good. It was great fun. Yeah. Was, yeah. Are you ready to um, in invite our panels? Yes. All good. Bring it on. <laughs> Hi. So yeah. Uh, so today we have actually assembled uh, an excellent panel of community leaders from various regions to share how they provide emotional support and manage sensitivities and meetups during difficult times. So we have Hamish Watson. So Hamish um, is actually a Microsoft Data Platform MVP with a passion for efficient database and application deployment using. Hamish is driven to educate and help others learn. He's a director on the past community board, international speaker, and a repeat guest lecturer at a local university. We also have Shamira Prajapriya. So Shamira is an entrepreneur of four different business startups and currently holds several accolades, including being an MVP in Asia and national and international awards. His passion is in IoT to provide better solutions for customers' requirements towards digitalizing business processes. So Shamira has a great passion and knowledge sharing with the Sri Lankan technical community, particularly in making sure the second generation is future ready. So he's a partner with STEM Up Educational Foundation. So finally, we have Steve. So Steve is a Microsoft MVP for Office Apps and Services and the co-founder of uh, and managing director of Stratos Technology Partners based in Christchurch, New Zealand. So he works as a consultant on, um, on a wide range of technology pro projects for organizations large and small. So he loves to help people engage with technology and is actively involved in the local tech community. So welcome all, and thank you for being here. So we have a short 25 minutes, and I want to quickly dive in here. So, um, so you know, with the rapid growth spread of COVID-19, it has changed and disrupted our lives in many ways. I mean, obviously, there's a daily human um, toll, there's significant economic damage and a whole new digital world that we're facing now. So the truth is that being in different regions, we are all facing, we're all in different phases of like dealing with the outbreak and obviously the impact on us varies, right? So in a time of crisis like this, community matters even more. So Steve, I'll, I'll get to you first. So as a community leader and a leader in an organization, what do you think are some of the key crucial qualities that a leader should have to guide their communities through the crisis? Hi, Suzanne. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, I think uh, the first, First thing, I've been thinking quite hard about this question, um, and I think the first thing is actually recognising there's actually a crisis. So it's quite easy to go along and not realise there's a crisis. Um, following on from that, working out what it is you can do to help, um, and that's really about empathising with the people that are affected, um, finding opportunities for the community to work in ways that they can help those people, and really just getting started. Um, I think a lot of people also have ideas, but they don't actually start. So it's still getting started. Right. Okay. So um, for Hamish yourself, what do you think? What is the key crucial quality? I guess, um, you know, we're, we're in an industry that is awesome, right? We've, we've got technology that can basically empower us to support our communities. You know what? We've got to keep in mind the human element and, and kind of, remember to have empathy and understanding of what our community is going through, um, but also uh, as well as the diversity of our community. And so the way I've kind of approached this, you know, I've, I run a whole range of meeting meetups and, and groups across the world. You've got to start small and you've got to get help. You've got to actually find people that are, are like-minded, right? And like Steve on this call, 
I just remembered three years ago, he and I ran a community event here in Christchurch. And now, you know, we, we started small. I found like-minded people, Steve and I work together. And we, we grew it out. And during times of crisis, you need help. You've got to reach out to people. And sometimes it's really hard to do that. But you've got to remember it isn't just about you. You know, and if you find the right kind of people, you find the right kind of technology, but more importantly, understand what you're doing and have that level of empathy. You know, crises are horrible to go through, but you can turn a positive out of that negative. You know, um, it can make you more inclusive person. It can make you um, grow as a person. But more importantly, you can use technology and the great thing that we are humans, we actually bring communities together and to go forward and, and make the world a better place. And, you know, that what we're going through at the moment with COVID is, is a great example of how, you know, we're now using video chat. We're, we're doing it right now, but we, it, it's a new way of, of dealing with things. And so again, you know, we've got to just appreciate the diversity of what uh, of people that we're dealing with mm -hmm. and understand that they will be going through different things and so you know when you're doing video chats and everything when you're running virtual groups just understand that people may not be completely on board but just listen and again be nice you know yeah. reach out to your to your community and yeah. again, as, as MVPs, we have a wonderful platform to engage with people and, and get through this. Yes, I, I can't agree more that compassion and empathy is actually key in times like this to support, um, to show support. So I'll turn to Shamira now. Um, I understand that you have done some events during like, you know, crisis. So can you share with us like what are some ways community groups can provide emotional support in times like this? Yeah, uh, so first of all, thank you for the organizers. Uh, let me join you with this one. For, and to answer your question, Susan, like, uh, I believe as the community and the professionals, like community leaders, we are the one who can support uh, for the other communities, like the people, uh, this kind of situation. So as Sri Lanka, so we were facing uh, two situations uh, during the same time last year, uh, same duration of the trail, we had to face a terrorist attack, uh, this attack. And this year, again, the same duration, we are facing for the COVID uh, situation. So I know hopefully all the professional knows that uh, Global Azure Bootcamp is, we are running on all other players. Uh, so uh, both years we were facing, struggling to run that event because uh, that is a one of the largest events in Sri Lanka, mm. all completed together. So I believe like uh, this is, I would like to share some uh, insight about the last year organizing stuff. So last year as an example, when we have that kind of a situation, so there was a lot of uncertainty among all the professionals, all the people in Sri Lanka. So we were also in a situation like how we can gather our community to one place and do this kind of a thing. So honestly, we were successful. Actually, we did a great event uh, with the support of three forces in Sri Lanka and the other facilitators, other basically local MVPs and other professionals, all these papers. So I want to give you some proof that with this kind of a situation, so our community, our professionals, our listeners are happy about how we get support. So if you can see my screen, I have a one comment uh, on which I have highlighted. Uh, I don't, I, especially I hide the, uh, hide the, uh, the person who put this on LinkedIn, yeah. but if you can see the highlighted part, so because with the terrorist attacks, all were pointing finger at one uh, race, but I say it is a terrorist attack. But uh, this is the one uh, has a doubt about okay, how can I participate, how we can uh, get interest with strangers. But successfully, end of the day, she has put this comment saying, I was able to spend a whole day with 250 plus strangers and it was a river to my passion. So that is the real commit we got out of there because uh, more than 20 hours, a lot of sessions, a lot of strangers, they get together, they ate together, drank together. So it was all together and they get introduced to everyone. 
So the word I want to highlight is we want to make our community to think about other person is one of us. If you have that kind of a mindset, so we won't face this kind of situation. Everyone is trying to support each other. So that is something I want to highlight uh, on the question. Yeah, and very often then what we neglect things um, that make a whole world of difference to an individual. I think we can be quite insensitive and stuff like that. So we need to make a conscious effort. So Hamish, back to you again. You mentioned about DNI, you know, diversity and inclusion. So what are some sensitivities that we should take note of when organizing global meetups? Yeah, basically, I mean, we, we need to um, take on board <laughs> the diverse range of people that are going to be at our meetups, you know, um, both in terms of, of gender, race, culture. Um, and, you know, uh, I live in New Zealand. Um, you know, we eat beer and pizza. Well, we eat pizza and drink beer. Um, and, and so one of the things uh, I did as, as part of my, my group was to actually, you know, have non-alcoholic drinks and have vegetarian pizzas because I, I looked out into my audience and noticed that half the people weren't eating or drinking because, you know, it, it was just a historical thing. And so, again, just having that thought of including people and, and thinking, how, how do they feel? Because quite often, um, I was lucky enough as part of what I'd done with the Muslim community here in New Zealand, um, I went to some of their ceremonies and at times I felt like an outsider. And it was actually a really, really positive thing in my life because it made me realize now I know how it feels for others who, who feel like they don't belong. And it literally, I didn't feel like I was excluded, but I just didn't understand what was going on. And so that's another part of being inclusive is explaining some of the things that are going on in the meetups, right? Especially for people who are new, who English is a second language, you know, just doing that small few things. And I'm so glad that I, I went along to another culture's ceremonies because it, it made me grow as a person. So again, you know, going back to the virtual thing, my, uh, my local meetup and data management is now virtual. So again, it's around the timing of it because, you know, we're all working from home at the moment. So it would be natural to say, well, Let's start it immediately at five o'clock. Whereas in fact, you need to think about, well, people need to decompress from their, their day at working online. You know, they will have done virtual chat all day. So maybe starting at 6 p.m., you know, just having that time for people to um, just reconnect with their family because often they might have been uh, stuck in a room in their house because they've got to shut their family out or, or whatever, right? And so again, I think there's a saying, you know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And I think at this time, we have a great opportunity to connect and to walk that mile in all of our shoes. And again, I say to people, reach out, talk to people, understand, and just ask questions because it, it might and will feel uncomfortable for you. But that's actually a good thing because now you kind of know how other people feel and it allows you to meet them halfway. And it's such a rewarding experience just seeing people engage and feeling included. Yeah, I think for me personally, I feel that the sensitivities um, as we move to digital world is kind of different. You know, it's no longer about just the pizza or whatever not, it's really more than that. So I'll turn to Steve now. Like, so how do we actually ensure that we don't leave any, anyone behind in a digital world? What do you think? Well, I think, um one of the challenges, especially when you've got a large meetup, you've got a large group of people meeting online, is making sure that there's not people in that uh, in that virtual room that are present but feeling left out. And so, um, it's very easy as an extrovert like I am to start and and, and rabbit on for a long time about a topic. Um, but what I've found is I've got to consciously stop. And I've got to ask around the room and don't keep asking your favorite person in the room or even the person you asked last time. Look for the person in the room that you wouldn't normally ask a question and ask. Mm -hmm. um, get their feedback. But it's not about embarrassing people either because some people are a little afraid to engage. 
So don't throw a difficult question at them. Yep. Give them a nice starter to get them started. Um, and I think the other thing that's probably really important here is when you're starting that discussion, right at the very beginning, is making it very clear what the purpose of this community is and what it's about. And, and by that, I mean the community's about talking about technology, but mm -hmm. really it's about the people in that community. So making sure that we're behaving in a way that's inclusive to others in the group. We're not, we're not misbehaving. Um, you know, we see code of conducts and so on coming up frequently now at every online event, um, and that's great. Um, but the very fact that we need one indicates there's a problem. So we need to be mindful of that, right? We need to make sure that that, that stuff doesn't get out of control. And I think the last thing that is that's really important also is if you're organising these online events is, uh, and you've got a diverse audience, make sure your leadership team is diverse. So bring people in to help organise and speak or participate in the group, not one person, but make it a committee or a group of people so that you bring different views in. You don't, you won't have them all yourself. Yeah, I think for us, we are also mindful that the events that we do, the meetups we do, we make sure we cater to a wide audience. And with us all now working at home, attending meetups at home, it's it's kind of difficult because sometimes we get a lot of distractions. Like what Tingi shared earlier, right? Like, you know, be it to provide attention to our aging parents who are at home with us or do with our kids who are, you know, doing their home-based learning. How do we struggle? Like for myself, I have like, I'm at home with my so many pets, like four cats. So yeah, how do we actually, you know, make that possible for, for the community to join us? So for us, for instance, we actually have the kids pack today. Yeah, um, just to make sure that, you know, guardians, parents, you know, can actually join us. And, you know, making sure that, you know, we're all so caught up Work-life balance is, is, I'm not sure if it's a thing anymore, you know, like, yeah. So we make sure that to throw in the exercises, like how Priyanka led, led the, the um, desk, desk yoga. Yeah, so we thought it was good. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to check whether we have questions at this point. Okay, it seems like we are, we are good. Um, yeah, so we are happy for anyone to actually jump in to share their community experience. I think it's good to hear um yeah we, we still have some some time so um back to shamira maybe i'll just ask you like what do you think like is important to you like the most important in this is in this period of time like doing like virtual meetups like for communities what is one key thing yeah uh this is something i want to highlight like uh, hamish and steve actually very clearly uh explained earlier about this but i think as it professional we are the one who are most benefited people during this situation and the people who can serve better to the community. So I will give two examples as why we are saying most benefited, like think about our life when you're working with the at office for the developers kind of, they doesn't have a time, like they will starting work in the morning and if there's a release, they have to work in night. But if there are people who are working remotely, right now we have the time still working remotely, but we are more engaging with our families and our, all the people Yes, as you feel it, we have to balance something about our other responsibilities. But still, we'll talk about the times we spend for traveling and everything, all get saved. And so that's why we say. And why I say we are the people who can uh, serve to the community. Because as IT professionals, we can do a lot of, uh, so by investing our other time, we can do a lot of community events. Right now, we do in Sri Lanka. And also we are doing a one kind of a situation because all the education system, the offline system is down. So right now the, there are a lot of uh, planned examination in Sri Lanka. What we have done is we collected all the lecturers in Sri Lanka and we have set up an online platform under STEM of Education, which is what we do here at Volunteer. So we provide one platform where our, all these students can learn their subjects. Those, those uh, lecturers will be online and everyone can join. So that's why I say our technology knowledge and the platform what we have, the capacities, we are investing all those to serve community better. So, and the one other thing is like what we do right now. Now, the, with more than what we are doing in the offline event, now we have a room to join foreign people, means overseas people, and anyone can join. That is the beauty of this. So, that's me. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think at the end of the day, it's really not leaving anyone behind and just having a very conscious, like make it a conscious effort to think about it. And yeah. So, okay, I think we have come to like sort of the end of our panel. We thank you very much for being here. I think it's very insightful. Um, good sharing. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Veron. Thank you, Thank you very much. Hello, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you for staying connected with us. Um, I hope you enjoyed our the very first event. Um, sorry for that we have encountered a lot of technical issue, um, but thank you for um, your generous comments and understanding. Um, so leaders share the three projects that um, they built to manage the, this crisis and tips on um, working from home and then also um, building the career remotely. And also lastly, the panel talk share um, from the various experience of to manage the community uh, under the top time. So now it's not done. Uh, we have the open mic. So um, I will invite the Sarah um, who will lead the open mic. Hello, hi. Hello. Um, oh. Hi, I'm uh, nice to meet you, I'm Sarah. I've actually been the one on the back end um, of, of this team producing um, Death Speak for the first time. So thank you so much for joining us for our first session. Um, so one of the parts I really miss from all the meetups is having an open mic. So that's a time when we can all connect um, and really talk about anything. Um, so if you have like a job, job opening you want to share or you're looking for a job yourself, you want a mentor on something um, or really just anything, um, we've actually created a space for us to all connect. Um, so Olivia will be sharing the URL that you can join really soon. Um, it'll be a quick 15 minutes. We'll keep it open-ended. Um, we'll be there to host all of you. So do join us. Um, if you want to get your afternoon snack or whichever it is, we can all just sit there and talk for 15 yeah, minutes. If you, if you have feedback, then you can um, add the hashtag devspec and then share on Twitter, then we are all ears. So thank you. Okay, um, I will let Olivia share her screen. Okay. See you at the open mic. Thank you.